so much, Sylvia. Um, so now for a little bit of a change of tack. I've been so appreciative of all of the amazing work Sylvia has done looking at the science, the geology. She knows everything about the planning process and the, what the government's been doing on A-level. So if you have any questions about any of that, let's dig into it in a little bit. But right now I wanted to share a story with you because I know these issues affect people in different ways. And I know for me, when I've been thinking about environmental issues and when I've been thinking about climate change, for years I heard the data and the numbers and the statistics, and that didn't move me. But it was when I heard the stories of the people that were suffering on the front lines of this crisis, that was what broke my heart. And so this is kind of my story of why I'm here, standing in front of you. Um, so this is me with my brother a while ago. He's now quite a bit taller than me. Um, and we grew up mostly here on the Isle of Wight. This is my most beloved place. And it's definitely why I am who I am today. I learned a lot, a lot of things from my time spent here. But two that I want to focus on are one, just a love for the natural world. When you grow up in a place like this, when you explore the downs, when you're in the ocean at Compton, when you're through Bryson Forest, when you're all over the place, you get this sense of the world being bigger than just yourself. And the second thing I learned growing up on the island was I actually went to private school in London. And so through my whole childhood, I had this comparison of what is life like on the island and what is life like in London. And so from a young age, I had this sense of social injustice, that I could tell that life <coughs> treats different people differently, and that economic and academic opportunities are different depending on what place you're born into and who you are. And so, as I set off into the world, those were kind of the two lessons that I learned growing up here. The other thing that really impa impacted me growing up was reading. I was always devouring stories, and for some reason, it was ones of environmental impacts that stuck with me. I remember reading about the Cray of Alberta, the First Nations people by the tar sands in Canada. I remember crying reading about people in the Amazon and deforestation. I remember being devastated by learning of the impacts on the children of Nigeria of oil drilling in the Niger Delta. And I, for a long time, understood this feeling of interconnection that I had with people around the world that even though I might not see exactly how my behavior was affecting them, I knew it was. And so that turned me into this like tiny little environmental warrior. And I really shouldered this crisis from a young age. And I was like, this is a behavioral crisis. If we just change our behavior, then surely that'll help. And so when my brothers left their lights on, I would go into their room and put like blanket over my hand and unscrew their light bulbs and hide them in their drawers because I was mad. <coughs> and I would stand guard over the recycling bin and be like, family, recycle! My dad will tell you, he's right here. Um, and for some reason I noticed that that didn't seem to change the world. And for my young self, I was like, what? It's like I'm doing everything I can. I'm recycling, I'm turning the lights off. And so next, I was like, okay, well, may, may, maybe it's a political crisis. And so I was 12 years old when I started writing to Andrew Turner, and I made sure that he never knew I was under 18 because, you know, you've got to be a voter to make your voice heard. And so I was writing political letters from a really young age. But I think a turning point for me in my understanding of environmental issues was when I began to see that environmental issues are human issues. And I know that one story that began to impact my understanding was this. This is the Superdome in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, filled with people, their homes ruined, no access to clean water, completely ignored by the emergency services of the United States as they helped to evacuate the more wealthy people. Almost everyone in that Superdome was black. And for me, that was a waking up call. I was 14 to, oh wait, these environmental impacts, they impact people differently. It depends how wealthy you are. 
It depends on the color of your skin. And that's just not fair. And so that was when I really began to develop this understanding of climate change and environmental issues being specifically a human health crisis. I was also learning more and more about climate change. When you're a like, young environmentalist, that, that's kind of the thing that you get to. You start with learning about deforestation and pollution, and then there's this looming one, climate change. And I was lucky enough that we studied it in school, and I learned quickly, I learned that by the end of this century, almost half of the world's population could be without direct access to water. That's hard to even wrap our heads around. What would that mean if half of the world's humans did not have access to clean drinking water? It means mass migration of millions, if not billions of people. It means war. It means the dropping of agricultural yields. It has so many knock-on effects that it's really kind of hard to imagine. And so I sat off to university, and this was my passion. Climate change was all I could think about. And I set into my first year of university, and I heard about something called the Big Green Bus, which is a bus that runs on waste vegetable oil and has solar panels on the roof. And I decided that I was going to live on this bus for the summer and drive around the United States visiting schools and businesses and music festivals and anyone that would listen to us. And we were going to talk about renewable energy and sustainable fuels and kind of really focus on those positive environmental stories. And so this is us on the strip in Las Vegas outside Flamingo Hotel talking to drunk tourists about sustainability. Um, and the bus had a big influence on me because it was the first time when I felt that I was really engaging with solutions. And I was like, oh, wait a second. We don't have to burn fossil fuels. There is another way. And so that led me to begin to study engineering. And I went back to university and I started to engage with that department. And I took all those courses and all my friends were engineers and I was really immersed in the world of engineering. And I became increasingly dissuaded that that wasn't actually where my heart was. I time and time again saw that we have all of the engineering solutions we need to solve this crisis. We have, in, with today's technology, we could be on 100% renewable energy within decades, but we're not yet on track for it. One example I just wanted to bring up was when wind turbines were proposed for the Isle of Wight. There was nothing scientific saying that these were a bad idea. It was culture, and it was community, and it was politics that stopped this from happening. And so you can imagine, it was kind of proposed in the same way that oil and gas is right now. A big industry is going to come in, and there's going to be big visual impacts, there's going to be no benefits to the community. And people maybe rightly kind of bristled to that, like, oh no, like, where's my say? How do I make my voice heard? And you can imagine this might have been different if, what if it had been one small village on the Isle of Wight who had said, we're going to put up a wind turbine scaled to the size to power our village. We're going to own it collectively. We're going to reinvest all of the proceeds in the local school. How might that have been perceived differently? And it was as I got deeper into engineering that I realized that it wasn't the engineering that was the problem. It was the culture surrounding it. And right as I became frustrated with kind of my reductionist engineering studies, a movement swept across the United States. And that was the fossil fuel divestment movement. And I threw myself in head first. I joined a campaign to demand that my university move the money in their endowment, their $4.5 billion, from the fossil fuel industry and to well, we were saying anything else, ideally to the renewable energy industry. And for those of you that haven't heard of the divestment movement, there's kind of two underpinnings of my, why we might want to divest. The first, we call carbon map. And so here, in the grey, 
you can see global fossil fuel reserves. So that's all the gas, oil and coal that fossil fuel companies have said, we already know where this is and we have every plan to go extract it. And then we have this number, two degrees. Two degrees, <laughs> thanks for me. Um, two degrees is the dangerous upper limit of of global warming, of temperature rise above pre-industrial levels agreed upon by the world's governments. This was reiterated at December's United Nations Climate Change Conference. And scientists tell us if we want to stay within two degrees, we can only burn 886 gigatons, we can only produce 886 gigatons of CO2 emissions. Yet, global fossil fuel reserves represent this many. And this much we have already burnt in human history, which means that we can only burn this much more. And we remember that burning all of this is incompatible with continued human recognizable civilization. This means mass war, mass migration, water shortages, food shortages. It's a future that like, we can barely even imagine. And so people are waking up to this. The smart money is already moving. $4.5 trillion have been divested from the fossil fuel industry as a result of a movement that started from a bunch of students in America saying that this might be a decent idea. And so we've begun to call this stranded assets. These are the fossil fuels that we just can't burn. And another really important thing to think about is these remaining fossil fuels, the ones that we can burn to stay within two degrees, existing oil wells, coal mines, refineries, all of the above, they use up all of that. And so the International Energy Agency has said that to stay beneath two degrees, we can have zero new fossil fuel infrastructure from 2017 onwards. That's next year. <laughs> That's next year. <coughs> Zero new fossil fuel infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and, and you, you COG are asking for tax relief because they're worried about the lack of, of the decline in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That was on the Today program yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. They're pleading that they want the government to give them tax breaks mm -hmm. because the um, annual um, in infrastructure investment has gone down from I think it was eight billion a year to under one billion mm -hmm. a year. Right. That's right. Thank Telegraph you. yesterday, investment in UK oil and gas industry set to fall by 90% this year as route continues. Good news. It's good news, <laughs> but it's bad news that they're asking for yeah. taxpayers yeah. to yeah. subsidise yeah. our own. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. We'll discuss more. Um, and so for me, that statistic, 2017, no new fossil fuel infrastructure, is the only one we need to know. Yeah. Even if wells are 100% safe, even if they will never leak, even if there will be no poison to our aquifers, even if they use no water, even if they magically fly the oil above the island and deposit it somewhere else, that doesn't matter because no new fossil fuel infrastructure from 2017. So I graduated from university and I went off to teach, actually. I had begun to realize that this is a cultural crisis and where is culture written but in our education systems? And so I went to teach at an alternative small environmental education high school program on the coast of Maine in the United States. This is one of my students, PT, at his first ever environmental rally. I broke years of school tradition by taking the students to a rally. Um, they all made signs and had a really good time and felt really empowered and excited to be part of this. And it was while working at this school last year that I noticed and paid attention to the fact that the United Nations Climate Change Conference that was happening in December was conceivably the most important one that we were ever going to face. Thinking about this 2017 deadline, <coughs> This was pretty much the last moment ever for the world's governments to agree to pay attention to the science. <coughs> and so I set off. 
I decided that I was going to bicycle to the United Nations Climate Change Conference from Maine. And I left in June of last year and bicycled through 11 countries along my way to the conference. And we gathered stories from people all along the way of grassroots mobilization. We wanted to go to communities and find the people who were stepping up saying, I recognize the issue of climate change and I want to shoulder some of the responsibility and I am taking action. And our question for them was, what first inspired you to do this? Because for me, it's those stories of that process of awakening that can then inspire others to do the same. And what we found were two threads of what it means to kind of fight climate change in this era. The first one was resistance. Everywhere we went, we found people courageously resisting fossil fuel infrastructure. And that includes here on the Isle of Wight. Fight Free Isle of Wight is doing everything that we could do to resist this one well. And this is a global movement. There's no such thing as an unopposed oil and gas well anymore. Absolutely all over the world, people are standing up and saying, enough is enough, we draw the line here. <coughs> the second side of the movement that we saw was the creation side. While you've got people resisting the bad stuff, you've also got people building the new stuff. And that is even more exciting. This is a hand-built yurt in Maine that we visited. This was built by one man over 30 years entirely by hand. And he grows all his own food, has no electricity, and so this is really taking it to quite an extreme. But in many other places along our way, we saw communities that were implementing renewables, that are growing organic food, that are embracing alternative models of economics, that are doing all sorts of beautiful things that are part of that new world. And then I got to the UN. which was quite an experience. After months on my bicycle, it was quite bizarre to like peel off my bike shorts and put on a blazer and go into the United Nations because I was actually an official United States youth delegate, so I had full access to inside the conference. And I want to kind of tell you the two stories of what happened in Paris in December. The first story is this one, it's the inside story. And the one you might have read in the newspaper was, goes something like, historic climate change deal signed, 195 nations come together in unprecedented dip diplomatic effort to say that we need to chart a new course forward for humanity. And that, that did happen. But there are also many other undercurrents to this story. While these heads of state and United Nations diplomats do look very jubilant, just around the corner are people in floods of tears. And a lot of those stories that were so hard to hear were the ones from people from the Pacific Island nations, mm -hmm. small countries in Africa, countries that were only able to send one or two politicians to represent their nation at this conference. And while the United States had 250 bureaucrats staying in a five-star hotel with limousines, Mali had one man who couldn't afford to buy meals and couldn't make it to all the meetings that were set up by the richer nations. And so the imbalanced power structures of our world are entirely at play here, which is why we see an agreement that does not mention the words fossil fuels, mm -hmm. not once, in the entire Paris Agreement, does it say fossil fuels? 